Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Local Lens. My name is Edward McCarver. My guest tonight is Joe Frankie. Now, Joe Frankie is a veteran in the paranormal world. Not only is he an accomplished investigator, he is also a seasoned researcher, demonologist, consultant, and lecturer with more than 36 years of experience. Joe is also on the board of directors for the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, tonight, the Warrens. Joe, it's good to see you again. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks for having me. It's, I think it was four years when we did our last, yeah. our last show. And I think for two months after that last show, I had to sleep with the lights on in the house. It was, it was, it was very scary, but, but it's good to have you back, Thank and I know you. you'll have some amazing... It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah stories you. for us. I mentioned that you're involved with the Warren Legacy Foundation, mm -hmm. which I understand is worldwide now. Tell us a little bit about that foundation. Lorraine and Ed Warren are past now. Um, um, God bless them. Uh, Ed died in 2006. Lorraine just passed in 2019. One of my best friends in the world is Chris McKinnell who is uh, the Warren's grandson. Uh, I was kind of joked on, I was like their adopted grandson. They were, they were family to me. I, I met them when I was 18 years old, you know, and they took me under their wing and, uh, and mentored me. We started this foundation a few years ago uh, called the Warren Legacy Foundation to carry on their work. I mean, we've been doing the work for, you know, 30 some odd years, but to carry on the work in their name uh, so the Warren Legacy Foundation, it's, it's a global network that we're still building that can, you know, to help people all over the world that may be afflicted with, you know, uh, paranormal, paranormal issues. However, you know, we don't turn anybody away, meaning if we, if we determine that there isn't uh, anything paranormal going on, it could be a mental health issue or, you know, something else, um, we try to help get those people the help they need. So we won't just, you know, say, well, it's, there's nothing paranormal going on here, so, you know, goodbye. You know, we, we don't do that. But we have a network of, of folks in, like, the United States. It's, we have it segmented, like the Northeast region. I'm also, Chris uh, kind of asked me because he didn't have anybody else to cover the Northeast area. I'm the regional director for the Northeast area, which means any cases that come through in this area, you know, which is all of New England, all the way down to Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, it's a big area. You know, I would find one of our team members that may be local and ask them to look into the case and then, um, you know, report back to me. We don't have a lot of members yet. Uh, I think only in the Northeast we've got about 10 or 12 members. So I personally have to get involved in a lot of these, so it's very time-consuming. Well, right, before I ask you yeah. about Ed and Lorraine Warren, who of course are legends in the area mm -hmm. of paranormal research, you say you have a hard time getting members. Is that how does one become a member? Anyone can apply for membership. Um, it's not that it, it, they're hard time becoming a member. Um, I myself am very say, finicky because I, in my region, the regional director is in charge of interviewing the candidates, and then Chris is the CEO of the foundation. I am the I'm actually the the chairman of the board, and I'm also CIO. And I'm not big on titles, but they, you know, they had to give me a title to, you know, um, you know, so people would know who I am and what I do. CIO is the chief investigative officer. Basically, you know, the the regional directors report up to Chris, but they consult with me if they have if they need help on cases. So I'm working on. There's one in Ohio. There's two in Michigan. There's one out in San Francisco area. You know, so I'm assisting the regional directors in those areas with their cases. I'll consult with them. We do a lot of Zoom meetings. If if the need arises and I have to jump on a plane, I, I may have to. Yeah, there. I might have to do that. Uh, if it's a demonic case and there's something really, you know, Chris and I are the ones with the experience there. Even our regional directors, uh, not all of them have a lot of experience with that type of work. You had mentioned you were 18 years old when you first met Ed yeah. and Lorraine Warren. Tell us what led up to that meeting and, and what well, the meeting was like. I, I have to give uh, credit to my wife, Laurel. God bless her. She, we were just dating at the time. and It was, it was 1986, and she saw in the local paper uh, the Warrens were doing a lecture at the Holiday Inn uh, off Exit 12 in North Haven. Uh, I don't think it's a Holiday Inn anymore. It's Best Western. Now. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it was a Holiday Inn at the time, 
And she's like, hey, would you, you know, would you like to, instead of going to the movies, would you like to go to see the Warrens? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I'd heard of them. I've seen them on TV and in print media. Uh, so I said, yeah, that'd be really cool. I was always fascinated with the occult and, and things like that. So we went. We're kind of in a line of people. Lorraine was at the table, you know, selling t the tickets. And when I, Laurel and I came up, she's looking at me. And she cocks her head to the side. And she's like, honey, and she called everybody honey. She was a sweetheart. <laughs> she said, honey, have we met before? And I, I said, no, Lorraine. I said, I've, I've heard a lot about you and Ed. I said, we've never met. I said, I'm really excited to be here and to meet you guys. And she's looking at me. And I found out later what she was doing was reading my aura. Well, she was a, a clairvoyant, and she could read the aura. of, of So I mean, we all have an aura. So that's supernatural. And she told, she told you that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your, what was your first marriage? Well, not, not there, but I'll, I'll get to that oh, in a second. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So okay. I tell this story all the time. I, I remember like it was five minutes ago. And she's reading my aura, and she's like, she was, honey, she was, there's a reason why you're here tonight. She was, come see Ed and I after the show. And I'm like, okay. Uh, here I am. You know, so I'm sitting there during the presentation, and I could, couldn't keep a thought in my head. And I'm like, Laurel's like, yeah, well, be quiet, be quiet. We you nervous? I was a little nervous. I'm like, but what did they want to talk to me about? Afterwards, you know, they, they wrapped up the show and it's like, all right, kids. He called everybody kids. Come on, kids. We're going across the street to the diner. The diner there in North Haven. I think it's still open. Athena. Athena. Athena Diner, yeah. So he's like, let's go over to the diner. Ed was, he loved his, his uh, strawberry jello or whatever. And <laughs> Lorraine used to order her cheese blintzes. I, rem I remember this. And he's like, come on over to the diner. So we go over there with Ed and Lorraine, Laurel and I, and Tony, their son in law who assist with their uh, lectures. And so I'm sitting across from Lorraine, and she's holding my hand, and she's reading my aura. She told me what she was doing. And she's like, I could tell by your aura you were meant to do this work. She goes, you, that's the reason why you came tonight. You were meant to do this work. She goes, would you like to come and work with Ed and I? And, and like, what was going through your mind? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like, oh, I, was, I was shocked. I'm like, yeah, I, I would love it. And, and Laurel came along as well. So what they did was they used to have classes in a little place called Holy Manor in uh, Newtown. It's now, I think it's now the Inn at Newtown. Okay. But it was a place called Holy Manor. It was a restaurant. And there was a little back room, maybe half the size of the studio here. And there was six of us, I remember. There were six students. What Ed would do, is he would bring in his notes and his tape recorder and recordings, video recordings and audio recordings of cases like Amityville. Uh, the Conjuring movies were based on actual cases. The Conjuring 1, the Rhode Island case. Mm -hmm. The Conjuring 2 was the Enfield, England case where he had voice recordings of, of spirits, spirit voices that would come out of thin air. I mean, he would be talking to these spirits, and you would hear them responding. Tell me your name, Ed would say, and say, Tommy. And it would be like a raspy voice, real deep, guttural, raspy voice. Tommy, soldier. He'd say he was a soldier or something. Then it would quickly shut the tape off, and it'd say, okay, we're not going to give it too much recognition. Yeah. You don't want to give yeah. these things too much recognition. And then, obviously, The Conjuring 3 was based on the Brookfield case, the, the devil made me do it case, as they call it. Uh, it was actually a demonic possession. We're talking with, let's let know yeah, who you're talking. Yeah. We're talking with Joe Frankie uh, on the board of directors of the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. You get the job with Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah. You're thrilled. I am. Tell us about your first assignments. What they were like well, working for the Warrens. The, War the Warrens were wonderful people. They were to me. They were like grandparents. I was Lorraine. always said, "Well, you're you're our adopted grandson." You know, <laughs> they treated me. Took took us both in Laurel and I, and they treated us like family. And so to me, they weren't like the world famous Warrens, you know, pioneers in this field. They were just like Graham and Gramps, you know, they were, they were grandparents. But um, the first thing that they had us do was what they called spirit photography. It was a Saturday, Sunday afternoon. Okay. They took us out and it's like, I'm going to teach you kids how to do spirit photography. He said, so what you would do is, you'd, back then we had like Polaroid and 35 millimeter. We didn't have digital cameras back then. And it would say... Get a roll of film, get a, get your camera, take a brand new roll of film and load it right there on site. Okay, we would use 400 speed film, seem to get the best results. Okay. Uh, especially if you wanted to blow up the picture or something. So 400 speed film, seemed, you could use 200 or 800 speed, but 400 speed is what we settled on. And remember, I, for the occasion, this is the first time I've been out with them now, for the occasion, I had bought a brand new camera. 
in this brand new camera and I was all excited and so it's taken us around um, the uh, uh, cemetery, Stepney Cemetery uh, in Monroe, Connecticut. Now, how old were you at this time? I was 18. 18, 18 19, 19. Young, freshable, and uh, <laughs> pretty, I wouldn't say I was scared, but I was apprehensive. I'm like, what am I going to experience? You know, because Ed would tell me, he says, sometimes you take pictures of old headstones. You can go right down here to Center Street Cemetery. And I talked to Bob Devaney, and yes, Bob, yes. Bob will let me in. He's I'm like, oh, okay, Bob. Joe, it's you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, I won't damage anything. Uh, and I'm taking pictures for about 10 minutes. And Ed looks over at me and goes, Joe, you got to take the lens cap off. <laughs> I was so nervous. I'm snapping <laughs> pictures. And I had the lens cap on the camera. And I felt like, you know, I could dangle my feet from a dime because there was other people there, too. Yeah. That was the, f the first thing they wanted to teach us out of spirit photography. He goes, sometimes you take a picture of an old oxidized headstone and you might see faces. And I did in some of them. You don't want to look too too long and too hard at something. And if you stare at a cloud formation long enough, you'll see Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, they call it pareidolia or okay. matrix, matrixing. Your, your brain plays tricks on you. So when picture, people send me photos, say, hey, Joe, can you take a look at this picture? If you see anything, I'll look at it. I say, within the first couple of seconds, if it doesn't jump right out of you, just delete it. There's nothing there. You know, because if you start looking, I think I see a face. No, no, there's no face there. Don't worry about it. You know, people just want to believe so much that they their mind sees things that yeah. aren't right there. So anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. I'm sorry. My first case, first bad case that I can remember, was in Bristol, Connecticut. We were at a lecture. It was at, I think it was the Ramada in Meriden. Um, we were there, and it got a phone call during the lecture. And I guess there was this family that were terrified. And I'll get to that in a second. But... Ed calls me out into the into the um, into the hallway. He's like, "Joe, I need you to. You, you got your equipment with you?" I go, "Yeah, it's in the car. Good investigator always has his equipment with him, right?" <laughs> so he goes, "I want you. Forget. I went with one other investigator. He goes, I want you guys to go over there right now." He goes, "This family's having experiences uh, and they're terrified." He goes, "Here's the address." He goes, "Call me when you get there." Okay. So I get out there and knock on the door. The family opens the door. I said, hey, I'm Joe Frankie. I'm with, you know, with Nesper, New England Society for Psychic Research. And they, they came in. They pulled me in, and, like, the whole family hugged me. They're like, thank God you're here. I swear to God. Was, out of relief. They, 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 they were, were relieved. Here. So the first thing, I walk in, and it's the living room area. It was This was a condo now. It wasn't a, home, a, a house, single-family home. It was a condo. And I look in, and they have the living room here, and the kitchen area, dining room area was over here, and there was a hallway, a couple of bedrooms, and a bathroom. And I look over, and in the living room was every piece of bedding, clothing, toys, everything these people owned was in the living room. Their mattresses, pillows, blankets. The family, what they would do is they were so terrified, they would huddle together in the living room. They would sleep there. They would, they would take watches. You know, like one person would stay awake, you know, while the other ones tried to sleep. And they wanted to be as close to the door as possible in case they had to run out. Now, so, so what was going through your so, mind when, when so you sailed? I, I didn't know. I had never experienced this before. This, you know, here I'm like, rookie. maybe I was 21, 22. 21 years old. I, you know, it was a couple of years that I had been in training, so to speak, before they'd let me venture yeah. out on my own. Yeah. I would go with them on cases, but I was by myself, basically. And the other guy I was with had even less experience than I did. And I'm like, okay, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really afraid, as I remember. I, mean, I was intrigued. I'm like, what's going on here? So I sat down with the family, and they're like, they would have these apparitions, these black hooded figures. They said they were almost as tall as a ceiling. So a normal ceiling is, what, eight feet? Mm -hmm. So let's say they were seven-plus feet tall. And they would see them come out of the back bedroom area. There was a back bedroom. And I went down there, and maybe there was one or two Legos on the floor. But every, everything was gone. The mattresses, the bedding was all moved out into the living room. And I'm like, well, what's going on? Why is it like this? And they explained. They said, we won't leave anyone alone in this house. I'm like, and, and this is one of my biggest pet peeves. You're paying rent or a mortgage on a home or a condo or apartment, whatever. And, and you're afraid to live in your own house. You're afraid to go down into the laundry room or you're afraid to go up in the attic or, or something like that because there's something maybe lurking. And, and, it, and it is many times, you know, but but in this particular case, I was like, what is going on here? So I called that. He's like, he goes, get your recording. Put me out. Let me know. Just let it run. 
Stay there all night with the family. Why, why do you think he sent you? Were you the only one available, or did he want you to... I was available, but yeah, he also wanted... He was, you know, trusting. Like a, maybe a trial? Yeah, maybe a test yeah, and he knew he okay. could trust me. Yep. And, you know, Chris will tell you, he's like, my grandfather loved you. He's like, he loves you more than he loved me. I said, well, <laughs> You know, but you know, but he did. Ed and Lorraine, they, I know they loved me. They yeah. they told me that. I so I so I remember setting up our equipment and we just let it run. And I said to the family, I said, "Look, I'm going to be here with you all night. Go lay down and try to sleep." And uh, nothing happened. It was a quiet night. It was a quiet night. Did you get to sleep? No, no, I stayed up all night. I right. so it was a quiet night, and I experienced that today when when. Whenever it seems, you know, now that I'm older and wiser and I've been doing this so long, when I'm in a case and there's a demonic presence, it usually hides. And I'm not, it's not that it's afraid of me. I'm a mortal. I'm a man. I'm just a human being. It's got, you know, the wisdom of the ages and power. You know, I've been picked up and thrown across the room. I was 350 pounds at the time, like it's a really, sack of potatoes. We need to talk about that. Yeah, we can talk about that later. I'm like, it has no reason to fear me except the fact that... Um, I, I'm not afraid of it. These things feed off your fear, okay? And they go after what I call, who I call victim souls, people that are easy targets, maybe uh, drug addiction or alcoholism or depression, severe depression. They go after the meek. You know, the, you know I'm not. You know, yeah, physical size, I'm, I'm a big, strong guy. And did, did Lorraine see that in the aura all those years? Oh, yeah. You, weren't we? Oh, yeah. She knew. She knew from my aura, and she told me, because I didn't know. I was fascinated with the, with the work. Yeah. I don't call it a job. This is a vocation, not an occupation. I don't get paid for what I do. I don't charge anything for you what I do. You have a passion for it. I, mean, I have a just passion for it. This was a vocation. Well, I'm, yeah. I, this is why my lectures take so long, because I don't <laughs> shut up. I had the, the woman from the library last night. She's like, Joe, I could sit there and listen to you for hours. I said, well, this is the easiest I interview it. I've ever done. Well, yeah, that's a, I, I do podcasts, and one guy said, Joe, he goes, I'm just going to introduce you and turn my mic off. Because <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking to Joe Frankie, uh, the board of directors for the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. Um, getting back to Ed and Lorraine Warren, yeah. um, tell us about the ghost safaris that they used to Yeah, have. yeah, and, those and, were which fascinating. Which included your first visit to their house? Yes, so... Um, the, I'm glad you brought that up. So the go, at the at their lectures, they would do periodically. They would do ghost safaris. So at their lecture, they would have a sign up sheet. So it, so what a ghost safari was was we would meet Ed and Lorraine at, at a local restaurant close to their home. They lived in Monroe. You, everyone would take their own cars, so it'd be like a wagon train, you know. Okay. And they would take us to various locations like a cemetery, a church, or uh, a sporting goods store. There was one out in that area. And, and we'd all get out of the car, form a circle, and then the rain would, would then uh, go on to tell us what happened at the site. So at the church, he was telling us about an exorcism that happened there that they were involved with. Uh, we would go, there was a sporting goods store out in, uh, I forget what town it was. It was out in that area, Easton or Monroe area. And I uh, said that the second floor, there was a spirit there. It wasn't a demonic spirit, but it was a spirit that was um, uh, very malevolent. And it would, uh, after 9 o'clock at night, all hell would break loose. You'd hear, you know, footsteps. You'd hear banging on the walls. After 9? After, it would say between 9 at night and 6 in the morning, I like the psychic hours. With 3 o'clock in the morning being the worst. Really? I said, that's called the devil's hour. This is what he taught me. Said that was called the devil's hour because anything that comes in threes is an insult to the Trinity. Okay, so three a.m. Oh, because oh. Jesus died on the cross at three p.m. Oh, okay. Okay, you know, I was okay. born and raised Roman Catholic, and I understand there's a lot of different religions, yeah. and, and yeah. people have their own beliefs, and I don't push my beliefs on anyone, but this is how I was trained. Okay, so when we get in cases where people are scratched, it's usually in threes, and they've got video threes. Three Scratch scratches, marks. scratches across their chest, across their back, yeah. Trinity, you know, it's it's it, anything that comes in threes, like you'll hear, you know, knockings on the walls, but sometimes they'll be so loud and violent they'll shake the house, you know. So Ed says, so anything that comes in threes is an insult to the Trinity, and it's usually not good, you know. Casper the friendly ghost or grandma <laughs> coming from a visit can't pick you up and throw you across the room. Yeah, an earthbound spirit can touch you it can scratch you you know but the things that we deal in you know the demonic 
they have power. They can lift up a refrigerator. You know, I mean, look, look at me. I weigh more than a refrigerator. <laughs> Pick me up and throw me across the room. And I wasn't, I wasn't so much scared. Yeah, I was scared, but I was pissed. And I got up. I'm like, is that all you got? You, mu-? I, I said a few choice words. Yeah. I'm not going to say here. But I'm like, you know, here I am, you know, like 21 years old. And, you know, big, big, strong guy. Look, but that really has nothing to but do with it. But how do you control your emotions? When, it's I mean, it's that, hard. In Bristol, I mean, you've got... You've in got Bristol, I mean, because people ask me all the time, well, weren't you scared? So back then when I first started, yeah, I was scared. Of course I was scared. I said, but somebody has to stand up to this stuff. Okay, somebody, somebody has to take a stand, which is why these things, we believe these things hide. Okay, if you've ever seen um, an exorcism, and I've been involved in them, where I've, I, I haven't done them, I'm not an exorcist, but I've held people down. I remember this woman, she was like five foot nothing, 100 pounds, and she, she there was four guys my size trying to hold her down. And was her it, eyes would roll back in her head. And was she was it still, like Linda Blair and the... No, was no, it wasn't like that. His head spinning around, spewing the pea soup and stuff, that's Hollywood. But they would speak in tongues, they speak in languages, uh, some of them were like old Aramaic languages that you wouldn't understand. They haven't been around for centuries. Uh, they are speaking Latin. Um, you know, uh, I remember the exorcist would say, don't acknowledge anything they say. If they, if they look at you and they address you, look away. Don't look them in the eye. Don't give them recognition. Because, you know, I, I'm there, I'm getting all ticked off and like, you know, like want to say F you, but <laughs> you, you got to be careful. Yeah. You got to be smart about yeah. it. So when yeah. I say, talk about strength, I talk about spiritual strength. You need to be strong spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. Okay. Because I know a lot of people that were in this work that are no longer in the work because they were affected by something. They weren't strong enough emotionally, psychologically, spiritually to, to be able to to handle it. I, I say, you know, it's like taking a stick and you poke a tiger in the face. I said, if you take a poke a tiger enough times, it's going to take a swat at you eventually. We're talking yeah. with uh, Joe Frankie so. from the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. He's on the board of directors. You're chairman, aren't you? Yeah, they right. voted me unanimously as chairman of the board for the Warren Legacy Foundation. So we are pretty much board driven. Uh, we have a CEO who's Chris McKinnell. Um, and I think there's seven, seven or eight of us board members. Tell us about your first visit to their home, which was on one of oh, these yeah. ghost I'm safaris and, and museum. So the ghost safaris, we're going to ghost safari, and the last stop on the ghost safari is Dudley Town. Dudley Town, they call it the Cursed Village. It's up in uh, northwestern Connecticut in Kent, uh, Kent Falls area. Okay. Um, up in that area. And um, it's a beautiful area. The Appalachian Trail goes through that area. There's 52 miles of Appalachian Trail that goes through Connecticut. And um, we, we drove up to uh, the end of um, Dark Entry Road, I think it was. There's Bald Mountain Road and Dark Entry Road. There's a couple of ways to get in. But it's a hike to get down to where Dudley Town is. Dudley Town, uh, all that's left of it is just some old stone foundations. Okay. There's no homes left or anything. You'd walk right by it if you didn't know what you were looking for. There's leaves and felled trees and everything covering it. So you got to know what you're looking for. So we go up there. Ed was just coming off his first heart attack, so he couldn't make the trek down there. It was pretty steep going, going down and coming back up. So uh, another one of their students that knew the way um, took us down in there. You know, so we, so we go down in there. He explains, you know, we look at the old stone foundations, take a bunch of pictures, come back up. We, we do a form a circle. Okay, kids, that's the end of the tour. You know, it, it was an all-day affair. You know, it started like 11 in the morning, and we finished at like 5 or 6 before it got dark. But eventually you, you got into, into the house. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Speed me up here. Yeah. Warren's car wouldn't start. Ed's like, yeah, I know I was low on gas. Maybe I just ran out of gas. <laughs> so, but I thought, so I'm like, all right, I pull out, you know, I'm a typical guy. I had my, my toolbox. So I end, I, end up, I end up finding a problem in fixing the car. It turned out to be a blown fuse. It was a fuel pump fuse. Uh-huh. That's all it was. Okay. Took the fuel. It took me a half hour to figure it out. Anyway, they were so happy. Like, come on, kids, we're taking you to dinner. So, you know, it was still early enough we go to dinner. So we had dinner, and then they take us back to the house. Go back to the house. This is where he first tells me about Amityville. You know, what happened at the house in Amityville. And he's like, you know, he said, the night they came back from Amityville, the first night they came back from Amityville, I heard this, like, taking uh, this thunderous noise, like sheet metal rattling. Okay, and he said, out of the basement stairs came this big black figure. 
And I'm, I'm sitting there, all the hair on my body is standing on that. I'm like, where did that happen? He goes, yeah, right about where you're standing. And he was serious. I'm like, really? He's like, yes, yeah. nonchalant. He says, I'll take you down to see the museum, but it's after 9 o'clock. We can't go down there. It's, it's not safe. <laughs> You know, so this is, you know, and they, they, they gave uh, Laurel and I the copy of the original Demonologist. I still have it today. I bring it with me when I go to speak and so people can see it. Um, it didn't sign a lot of things. Lorraine usually did the signing, but I've got a few items that are signed by them uh, that I bring. Was there a reason he wouldn't sign? No, no, no. It's just he was usually just off, you know. He, when Ed finished the lecture, he wanted to pack up and get out of there. He's like, come on, kids, let's go. Come on, Lorraine. And Lorraine was such a sweetheart. She'd be talking to everybody. You know, that's what I do. I'm like, you know, I look over at the librarian. And I'm like, I'm sorry. And like, oh, you're fine. You know, I, I don't want to be rude to people. And yeah. I'll give them a card and say, hey, send me an email. I'll, I'll respond. But that was the first time we were at their house. And it was really creepy being there with the museum and everything. I bet. I bet. But, In the less than three minutes we have yeah. remaining, we're talking about Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah. Um, and what you do and what they do is very serious business. Yeah. But there is some room for humor. And in doing research for this, um, mm -hmm. tell the Grim Reaper story in less than three minutes. Every, every Halloween they would do a, a lecture, a big event. And this was at Stony Hill Inn in Bethel, which is no longer there. They bulldozed it and it's condos now. But Ed and I came up with this idea. At a certain point during the show, he was going to give me a signal. And I had this Grim Reaper costume. <laughs> that I, I had bought, and uh, it had the, um, the, the the robe and the cloak and the hood and everything. And I bought this skeleton mask that glows in the dark. So I held the flashlight up to it and it glowed. So I put on sandals, because I don't want to come in in Nikes, you know? <laughs> you know. So I put sandals on, I had black sweatpants on. So I snuck around the back of the building outside, and, and before people came in, I had to put a little rock in the back exit door so I could open it. So he's got people spellbound. He's talking. And uh, I sneak in the back door. Outside, I, I shined a flashlight on, on the mask so it was glowing. I sneak in, and I had a scythe. It was a plastic one. <laughs> you know, but uh, full size. So I sneak in the back, and I just stood there. And everyone was so fascinated by what was going on on the screen and everything. They didn't see me. Oh. I was all in black, too. Yeah. But my face was glowing. All of a sudden, it's like... What are you doing here? What, get the hell out of here. Who are you? <laughs> and I, I, I came up with this. I took my finger and I went like this. Oh. The bony finger. And I pointed it right at him just like that. And he clutched his chest like he was having a heart attack. And I walked, as I was doing that, I walked slowly up. I took my cloak and I threw it over him and took him out of the room. And the place just roared with applause. You know, by, by that point, they knew it was a joke. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, here I was this big hulking figure, and I had this, uh, so I'm going to do that again in New York in a couple of weeks, funny. but I want to spill the beans. Joe Frankie, it has been a pleasure. It's been, it's my, been pleasure. my pleasure. Thank it's you for having me. And I say this is the easiest interview I've ever done. Yeah, well, so. i got plenty of stories to so. tell. That's why I said a half hour, an hour, just goes by like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you clearly have a passion for, yeah. for what you do. 36 years, huh? 36 years. Wow. Yep, 1986, wow. 2022, yeah. yeah. So good Almost for you. 40 years. Good for you. Well, thank you for stopping by. My this pleasure. has been uh, Edward McCarver here at Local Lens. We'll see you soon.